And okay, so just uh, quickly, so what's the word problem in a group? So we have a group and we have a finite generating set for that group. So the word problem is a decision problem, right? Someone hands you a word in the generators of the group and you wanna decide whether or not that word represents the identity element uh, of the group, right? And if there's an algorithmic solution to this problem, right, a computer program that can, after a finite time, spit out yes or no, then uh, the group has solvable word problem. And there's lots of groups that have solvable word problem. Sort of any group uh, whose elements are some sort of concrete thing that you can keep track of has solvable word problem, right? Like a uh, group of integer matrices always has solvable word problem. Um, and right, as a general rule, having solvable word problem is inherited by finitely generated subgroups, right? If you know how to solve the word problem in a group, then in any subgroup, you're going to see the same thing because you just use the same algorithm. And so like any decision problem, the word problem sort of inherently has two parts. Somebody gives you a word, uh, it's possible the word represents the identity, and then you want to be able to figure that out in finite time, right? And it's possible the word doesn't represent the identity, in which case you want to be able to figure out that out in finite time. And one of these parts tends to be kind of easy, right? If you're in a finitely presented group, which are the kind of groups that, uh, I don't know, people that I hang around with care about a lot, uh, right? So if, if you have a finitely presented group, uh, then you can always figure out if a word uh, is equal to the identity in finite time, because you just have the relations and you just start deriving all possible consequences of the relations. And eventually, if your word is the identity, you figure it out. And a group doesn't even need to be finitely presented for that to be true. If a group is computably presented, which means that there's an algorithm to list a set of relations for the group, uh, then uh, you can always figure out when a word is the identity, right? So the hard part of the word problem is uh, if a word's not the identity, is there some way of figuring that out in your group? And this brings us to an observation. So this was uh, observed by Kuznikov uh, in a seminar in, in Russia in 1958. It was not sort of widely disseminated. It was independently observed by Thompson in 1969 that if you have a finitely presented simple group, it always has a solvable word problem. Okay. So why does every finitely presented simple group have a solvable word problem? Well, if a word is the identity, then you can figure that out because it's a finitely presented group. But what if a word is not the identity? Well, if your group is simple, right, then it doesn't have any non-trivial quotients, right, non-trivial proper quotients. So if you add any more relations to the group, the whole group should collapse. Right. So if a word does not represent the identity, then you can tell because what you do is you uh, add the relation that the word is the identity and you see whether you can derive that all the generators are trivial. And so you just do these two searches. So you search for a proof that the word is the identity and then you search for a proof that the word is not the identity by assuming that it is the identity and seeing whether the group collapses. One of those searches terminates. So finally presented simple groups always have solvable word problem. And so this led Boone and Higman to conjecture in 1973 that in fact, uh, group G has solvable word problem if and only if uh, it's a subgroup of a finally presented simple group. And so subgroups of finally presented simple groups always have solvable word problem, but they conjectured the converse to be true as well. And I think this was motivated by uh, this famous Higman embedding theorem, uh, which, uh, so Higman embedding theorem is that a group is computably presented. And remember, computably presented is the same as being able to tell whether words are the identity algorithmically. And so it's a true theorem that a group is computably presented if and only if it embeds into a finitely presented group. And so, uh, Having a solvable word problem is also being able to tell when a word is not the identity. And so this was their conjecture of sort of a corresponding theorem. Sorry, can I ask, is computably presented the same thing as recursively presented? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's uh, some people in logic who think that computably is a better word than recursively. Okay, just, uh, just, so, you know, just to keep up to date with the language. Yeah, sorry, following that trend. Uh, anyway, yes, can be yeah, recursively presented. 
Uh, okay, and uh, Boone and Higman, they were not able to prove their conjecture. Uh, they proved a weaker form of their conjecture. They proved that if a group has solvable word problem, a group has solvable word problem, if and only if it embeds into a computably presented simple group. So not necessarily finitely presented, but computably presented. Uh, this is the same thing as saying a group has a solvable word problem uh, because of that Higman embedding theorem, if and only if it embeds into a simple subgroup of a finitely presented group. But the conjecture is that the simple subgroup can be the whole finitely presented group. So anyway, so this is so this Boone Higman conjecture, a group has solvable word problem if and only if it embeds into a finally presented simple group. It's been open since 1973. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about. And I don't know, I'm not sure that we've made any significant progress on the conjecture in general, but uh, what we do is uh, you know, take some groups that we like and see if we can embed them in finally presented simple groups. So what are some finally presented simple groups, right? So the basic finally presented simple group is Thompson's group V, right? This was the largest of three groups uh, defined by Richard J. Thompson in the 1960s. And how does Thompson's group V work? Uh, we've already seen some definitions of it. I'm gonna describe it in a slightly different way. Um, so V acts on the, the Cantor space, which is the uh, space of all infinite binary sequences. And the way that this Cantor space works is if you have any finite binary sequence that determines a subset of the space, which I'm going to call a cone. So there's the zero cone and the one cone and so on and so forth, right? And uh, the way that these cones work is that if you have any two cones, there's sort of a canonical homeomorphism between them, a prefix replacement homeomorphism, where you just take the prefix for this cone and remove it and prepend the prefix for the other cone, right? And so what's Thompson's group V? An element of Thompson's group V is that you take your domain canter set and your range canter set and you partition them into cones. And then you map the domain cones to the range cones somehow by prefix replacement homeomorphisms. And so that's Thompson's group V. And Thompson proved in 1965 uh, that V is finally presented and simple. Uh, he wrote it on a piece of paper and then showed the piece of paper to a lot of people. <laughs> so I'm also crediting Higman because, you know, he published it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so V is finally presented and simple. Okay, so we want every group with solvable word problem to embed in a finally presented simple group. So what can we get inside of V? Well, some things, uh, not a lot. So finite groups all embed into V because V contains all the finite symmetric groups. Uh, free groups embed into V. Free abelian groups. Um, locally finite groups, various free products, wreath products, things like this embed into V. You know, so that's, that's a lot of things, but it, it doesn't at all seem like, uh, you know, a significant fraction of the groups with solvable word problem, right? All these groups that people uh, play with are not known to embed in V. Um, and by the way, it, I should mention, it's an open question whether any uh, one-ended hyperbolic groups embed into V. One-ended just means like not a free product uh, hyperbolic group uh, and, uh, and not virtually cyclic. Um, so for example, we don't know whether the fundamental group of uh, surface embeds into V. Um, but there's also, there's a bunch of things that are known to not embed into V. So uh, GL3Z does not embed into V. This was shown by Higman uh, in 1974 in his paper, which was the first, you know, published paper about V. Right? And it, Higman was interested in this Boone-Higman conjecture because, you know, it had his name on it. <laughs> and so, uh, right, so he proved that GL3Z does not embed into V. Uh, Q does not embed into V. Uh, it was later found that groups of Burnside type can't embed into V. So every uh, every finitely generated torsion subgroup of V is finite. Uh, and uh, there's like just some really basic free products like Z free product Z squared turns out to not embed into V. And there's lots of things that have Z free product Z squared in them. So those won't fit into V either. And so this list of non-subgroups of V 
I guess I would say is fairly good evidence that there's not like a lot more that's going to go into V than we already know, right? We have we have this list here of stuff that goes into V and probably, except for like maybe some hyperbolic groups we don't know yet, uh, probably that's about it. So V is not going to cut it if we want to prove the boon hickman conjecture. What we need are more finitely presented simple groups. Okay, so where are we going to get finitely presented simple groups from? Uh, well, we're going to make some metal groupoids. So, uh, so suppose you have a candor space X, and uh, we've seen this construction several times here. It's this basic construction of uh, transformation groupoids. So uh, you take ordered triples, where the first and last things are points in X, uh, and the middle thing is some kind of homeomorphism uh, of X. Or, you know, if you want to use a, a local homeomorphism or a partial homeomorphism, that's just fine as a candor space. So you can extend anything. Uh, okay, so that's that's the set of triples, but what we're going to do is we're going to put an equivalence relation on those where two triples are equivalent if H and H prime agree in a neighborhood of the domain point. Hmm. And so the equivalence classes are what are called germs, right? So these are germs of homeomorphisms uh, on X, and the germs form an Intel groupoid. The germs form an Intel groupoid, uh, and it is it is by the way. So we've had uh, some discussion about whether a Tau groupoid is like does the Hausdorff condition matter. This is an example of a very non-Hausdorff a Tau groupoid. You're using all homeomorphisms. Yeah, you just use all homeomorphisms. This makes a very non-Hausdorff a Tau groupoid. What's non-Hausdorff about it? So to be Hausdorff, you would need that if you had any two germs at the same point there would need to be uh, partial homeomorphisms containing them that uh, don't agree on any open set. And there's just, there's lots of pairs of germs that don't have that property. So these groupoids, so this groupoid of all germs is, is very much not how stored. Is, and the, is the unit space X? Yeah, so the unit space is, well, the unit space is right, the identity, the identity germs on X, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so the unit space is Hausdorff, but the Etel groupoid itself is not Hausdorff. Um, and uh, we're interested in, in this groupoid, we're more interested in subgroupoids of this. So a groupoid of germs on X is a subgroupoid of this that contains the whole unit space. So you just take X and you, you know, declare a bunch of germs that you like. And it has to include all the identity germs and has to be closed under composition and inverses. And this is a groupoid of germs on X. And sometimes these are Hausdorff and sometimes they're not. Uh, Hausdorff is somehow not a very natural condition to ask about when, when you're looking at groupoids of germs. Uh, and so by the way, I should say, so groupoids of germs, uh, it's how groupoids of germs have the property that they're what are it's called effective, which is if you take the isotropy bundle of the Italian groupoid, so that's all of the elements of the groupoid whose source and range point are the same, uh, the interior of that is just the unit space, right? And so what that means, so if you had an open set in the interior of this, right, that gives you some partial homeomorphism that's mapping each point to itself, right? And the point is, we want the only partial homeomorphisms to do that to actually be identity. Right? So that's what, that's what this means. And more generally, if you have an Intel groupoid and it satisfies this condition, it's effective, uh, then it is isomorphic to a groupoid of germs on some like locally compact Hausdorff space. Okay, and so a basic example. So this is a groupoid that we've we've seen already several times. So you take the canner set and you take the shift map on the canner set. So this is the map that just deletes the first digit of an infinite binary sequence. And you just take the groupoid generated by all germs of the shift map. And so the shift map has a germ at every point, and you just take those germs as your generators for your groupoid. Uh, and so what groupoid do you get when <laughs> the elements of the groupoid turn out to be, in fact, all germs of all prefix replacement maps? Uh, and this is a sentence that I thought I should say. <laughs> But my level of understanding of the sentence is like 60, 70 percent. Okay. 
Okay. So this is the the tau groupoid whose reduced C star algebra is the Kuhn's algebra O2. This particular one actually Hausdorff. Uh, this one is Hausdorff. Um, and it's it's because if two elements of V, yeah, there's just not elements of V that have that property. Yeah. Um, okay. So how are we going to get? Do you know if it's isomorphic to the usual groupoid of the Kuntz? I mean, you said only six percent. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is. I think this is the usual. This is a description of the usual groupoid of the the Kuhn's algebra. Yeah, and and you can also just uh, you know I've done this with a binary alphabet. You you could do this with an n-ary alphabet, uh, and you get a groupoid that gives you the n-ary Kuhn's algebra. This is just sort of a different description of that groupoid. Okay, so how do we make finally presented simple groups? Well, here's the idea. So if you have a Cantor space and you have a groupoid of germs on that Cantor space, you make what's called a topological full group. And what is the topological full group? It is all the homeomorphisms of the Cantor space whose germs are all in the groupoid. So it's all the, what are these bisections? These are all the bisections uh, of the whole Cantor space that you're getting from the groupoid. Okay, and that's the topological full group. And so, for example, if you do this with this groupoid, the groupoid of the full shift, the topological full group is Thompson's group V. And the reason that we care about this is it turns out that sort of most known finally presented simple groups are topological full groups of the tau groupoids of uh, germs. And it's not true for all. There's things like Thompson's group T. Thompson's group T acts on a circle, not a Kenner space, right? But, but actually, Thompson's group T embeds into V. So as far as in trying to embed things into finally presented simple groups, uh, T doesn't matter so much. And so uh, groups of this form, these turn out to be the ones that are helpful for embedding things into finally presented simple groups. And by the way, there's no reason that these have to be finally presented simple. The statement is just that most of the finitely presented simple groups we know are of this form. Okay, so here's a simple example. So take that group word of the full shift and just take a direct product of two copies of it. So uh, this acts on a direct product of two copies of the Kenner set, which I have drawn here. And so this is the Kenner square, direct product of two copies of the Kenner set. And then what you do is you take the topological full group of that, and that's something called the Bryn Thompson group UV. And so this was introduced by Matthew Bryn in 2004. And so what does this mean, really? So here's what an element of 2V looks like. So you take your Cantor square in the domain and range, and you can cut them up into pieces that are products of two cones. So here we've got these four pieces here, each of them is a product of a uh, X cone and a Y cone. Then we've got pieces here. And then each piece here is mapping to the piece of the same color over there by a map, which is a prefix replacement in both the X and Y coordinates. And so 2V is the group of all such maps. Uh, and you know you can do this by taking a product of any number of copies of the, the groupoid for the full shift. And you get the, the family of Bryn Thompson groups. Uh, and Bryn proved that all of these groups are finally presented and simple. Um, and we're about to embed things in them, but I do want to mention uh, these groups are also interesting because they have very interesting algorithmic properties. So these are finally presented simple groups, but it's been proven that these groups have unsolvable order problem. So there's no way, uh, given an element, of nv for n greater than or equal to two, there's no algorithm to determine whether it has finite order. Uh, and these groups also all have unsolvable conjugacy problem for n greater than or equal to two. As, as far as I know, this is the first example of like, 2v is like the first example of a specific group that people had been looking at. They'd already computed as presentation. It was not being looked at for having unsolvable conjugacy problem and it was proven to have unsolvable conjugacy problem. So it's somehow the first one of these arising in nature. Is there some standard proof that to prove is simple if it's a topological full group? 
Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. It's, it's always dicey. Uh, simple's always dicey. Finally presented's always dicey. We'll we'll see some ways of doing both of these things. Brendan didn't use that topological. Function. No, he just he did a direct uh, proof that it's simple using an Epstein type argument, um, and a direct proof that it was finally presented. Um, okay, and so one embeds in these Bryn Thompson groups. So uh, it turns out a lot of things. So for example, it turns out every right-angled Arden group embeds into uh, all of the NVs for N greater than or equal to two. Right-angled Arden groups are groups that have some finite generating set, and then some of the pairs of generators commute. So this is independent of N? Uh, yeah, so uh, actually, so I'm listing two, two groups up here. So we proved that for every right-angled Arden group, there exists an N. Huh. That works. And then Salo recently proved that, uh, in fact, they all go in 2V. Into 2V. Okay. Into 2V, yes. And, and hence into NV for all uh -huh. N greater yes, than yes, or equal to 2. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so that's a lot of things. And there's, there's lots of stuff that's known to embed into right angled Arden groups uh, or uh, to virtually embed into right angled Arden groups, which turns out to be enough. So there's all sorts of other things that go into these groups, NV, like all finally generated Coxeter groups uh, embed into NV. And there's all sorts of uh, like hyperbolic groups and fundamental groups like three manifolds and stuff that are known to embed in right angle Arden groups and hence embed into the NVs. So the subgroup structure of the NVs is somehow very rich, much richer than the subgroup structure of just V. Okay. So uh, how do we find more examples? How can we form, find more etal groupoids of germs for which the topological full group is simple? So there is this wonderful theorem of Matui. So Matui proved that if your groupoid of germs is minimal and purely infinite, then the commutator subgroup of the topological full group will be simple. Uh, okay, so what, what are these things? So you have a groupoid of germs on a Kenner space. It's minimal if every orbit in X is dense, and it's purely infinite. If for every Klopin set, you can find two elements of the group that map that Klopin set into two disjoint subsets of itself. And so the theorem is, so you need those two properties. You need dense orbits, and you need to be able to take sets and put them inside themselves in, in two disjoint ways. And you get that the commutator subgroup uh, is simple. Commutator subgroup's not the whole topological full group. Oh, so if you want a whole topological full group, you have to get lucky and have it be the same as its commutator subgroup. And this is what happens for V, for example. V is equal to the commutator subgroup of V. Uh, and in fact, basically the easiest way of proving that V is simple is to prove that the commutator subgroup is simple and then to prove that V is equal to its own commutator subgroup. Okay, so how can we use this Matui theorem. So this tells us if we want to make finally presented simple groups, then we want to make it tell groupoids that have these properties, minimal and purely infinite. So here's an example, Scott's groups. Uh, and these are some Thompson-like groups. They seem to be not very well known. They came out in 1984, and the, the paper has sort of very different language than modern language. So I think people tend not to know about these. But these are some finally presented simple groups that contain GLNZ. Uh, okay, so how are we going to make finally presented simple groups that contain GLNZ? Well, I guess we're going to want GLNZ to be acting on a Cantor space. GLNZ acts on Z to the N, but that's not a Cantor space, right? But if instead of Z, if we switch to using the two attic integers, and that is a Cantor space, and GLNZ acts perfectly well on vectors of you know, n-tuples of two attic integers. So that gives at least an action on a Cantor space. It's not a very minimal action. If, for example, the orbit of the zero vector is just the zero vector. But we can fix that by allowing uh, affine transformations instead of just linear transformations. So you're allowed to add uh, tuples of integers. And so that's a larger group. It contains GLNZ, and, and, and that group acts minimally on Z2 to the N. Uh, that still isn't purely infinite, though. Uh, in fact, the action of the affine group is measure preserving. So you just have to, you know, throw something in 
uh, willy nilly to make it purely infinite. So we'll just throw in the, the germs for uh, the doubling map. V goes to two V. Uh, and so that gives you an entire groupoid of germs, just generated by germs of affine transformations and germs of this. Uh, and the corresponding topological full group turns out to be finally presented and so forth. Can I, can, no. oh, so the topological full groups didn't exist yet. So, so. Uh, yeah, so as I said, this paper, <laughs> this paper is in completely different language than, I mean, it's, it's not in topological full group language. It's also not in Thompson group language or anything like anybody does uh, today. Yeah. Uh, I was about to ask: Is this uh, is this the same, or is it bigger than the thing generated by the affine group and the 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 group generated by the affine group and V and V? Well, um, so well the the V. So right, this is not this is not by infinite binary sequences. This is n tuples of infinite binary sequences. Mm -hmm. But you can think of those as infinite sequences over an alphabet of size two to the n. Yeah. And then yeah, it's generated okay. by the affine group and the V for that. Yes. Yeah. Does uh is V going to or doubling v, the vector V? Is that not already a GLN transformation? Uh no, because it doesn't have uh invertible determinant. And the rest, so elements of GLN Z have to have determinant one or minus one. Oh, okay. Because uh, it's Z. Because it's Z. Oh, it's Z. Z. <laughs> um, and so, by the way, once you get GLN Z in finally presented simple groups, you get all sorts of other things. Like, for example, the right angled Artin groups embed in these also. Uh, it also follows from this that if you have a group of polynomial growth, uh, it embeds into a finally presented simple group. So there's this famous theorem by Gromov that you have a group of polynomial growth, which is to say, you know, there's a polynomial number of elements that can be expressed with words of length less than n, uh, that such groups are exactly virtually nilpotent groups, uh, finally generated virtually nilpotent groups. And it's known that all such groups embed in GLNZ. Okay. And here's another example maybe people are more familiar with is a Rover's group. So uh, this is based on Grigorchik's group, which is this uh, self-similar group. It's a certain group of automorphisms of an infinite rooted binary tree. Uh, it was introduced by Rostislav Grigorchik in about 1980. Uh, it's a very famous group. Uh, it's first off, it's a concrete example of a Burnside group, which is, is infinite, finitely generated, and every element has finite order. Very interesting property for a group. Uh, it was the first known example of a group with intermediate growth. So the growth is between polynomial and exponential. Uh, and as a result of that, it was the first known example of an amenable group, which is not elementary amenable. So, you know, this is a group that people care about. Uh, it doesn't embed in V because it's a Burnside group and Burnside groups don't embed into V. Uh, Burnside groups don't embed into any of the NVs, by the way. Uh, okay, so... How do we get this in a finally presented simple group? Well, Grigorchik's group, it acts on the infinite binary tree, so it acts on the Kenner space of ends of that tree. And uh, that's not a very good action. It's a measure preserving action. So it's, it's in particular, it's not gonna be purely infinite. You won't be able to map things into smaller things. So you have to, you know, chuck something in there to, to make it purely infinite. So we'll just, we'll throw in the germs to the shift map. And uh, so this- What do you mean by stroll in the germs of the shape? So we're, we're taking the Ital groupoid of germs generated by all germs of elements of the Grigorchik group together with all germs of the shift map. So you're basically chucking in B. Yeah, and this is, as far as the group so goes- Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, this is exactly the group. This is the cheating, right? <laughs> yeah, this is exactly the group generated by Thompson's group V and the Grigorchik group, right? And Rover proved that this is finally presented and simple. Okay. Uh, and Nekrashevich later generalized this to uh, a class of self-similar groups. These, these are this you know general kinds of groups acting on infinite rooted trees. It it doesn't work for all of them because the uh, uh, rover got lucky somehow that his topological full group was simple. 
right? So if you just take a, a arbitrary self-similar group and make this, there's there's no reason that the topological full group will be simple. What about the virtually simple? The commutator subgroup will be simple, but the self-similar group doesn't necessarily go in that. Okay, so uh, okay, so here's what I want to talk about today. So hyperbolic groups. So what are hyperbolic groups? So uh, this is the definition due to Gromov. A hyperbolic group is a series. You think of a group as being uh, the same as its Cayley graph, okay. and a uh, group is hyperbolic if this Cayley graph is sort of coarsely negatively curved. So what does this mean, negative curvature? So, uh, so this is a phenomenon that you see in the hyperbolic plane, right? That uh, that you can mimic in a graph, which is if you have a triangle of geodesics in your graph. So these are three vertices of the graph, and these paths are supposed to be shortest length paths in the graph between these these vertices. So that's a, a geodesic triangle, and you take uh, there exists a delta so that if you take a delta neighborhood of any of the two edges of the triangle, the union of those two delta neighborhoods contains the third edge. So every point on this path is within delta of a point on one of those two paths. And so a group is hyperbolic if there exists a single delta that works for all triangles. And uh, so lots of hyperbolic groups, for, for example, any fundamental group of a compact hyperbolic manifold is a hyperbolic group. So the <laughs> people care about a lot. It's also, it was sort of stated by Gromov and proven by Olshansky that in a certain precise sense, almost every finitely presented hyperbolic, uh, finally presented group is hyperbolic. And if you write down like a random presentation of a group, uh, the chance that it's hyperbolic is very high the bigger the presentation is. Okay, and so the theorem I'm talking about is we've shown that every hyperbolic group embeds into a finally presented simple group. Um, and by the way, hyperbolic groups are known to have solvable word problem. Hyperbolic groups are almost the first class of groups that were shown to have solvable word problem. This is due to Dane, who is the one who identified the word problem uh, as an important thing. Uh, right, so he showed that a fundamental group of a surface has solvable word problem and generalized this to something called a Dane presentation that every hyperbolic group has. Uh, and you always get an algorithm for the word problem for hyperbolic groups. So we're gonna prove that every hyperbolic group embeds into a finally presented simple group. Okay, so the proof has three steps and they're all kind of complicated. So the first step is we need a Cantor space on which a given hyperbolic group will act by homeomorphism. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing, so then after you have that, so you have your hyperbolic group acting on your Cantor space, uh, we need the topological full group to be finitely presented, right? And ideally simple. It, it's not gonna be simple, <laughs> but it is gonna turn out to be finitely presented. And so this is, uh, I think, a very interesting class of etal groupoids of germs is we're gonna have these hyperbolic groups and they're gonna be acting on very naturally defined Cantor spaces. And uh, you get an etal groupoid of germs that way and the topological full groups turn out to be finally presented. Um, and then uh, there's gonna be this problem that the topological full groups are not simple. Uh, but we have a trick that embeds the topological full group into a larger finitely presented uh, simple group. And it it works for like just about any topological full group. Um, I'll show you how that works. But okay, so let's let's start. So uh, where are we going to get a Kenner space from? Well, it turns out that whenever you have an infinite graph, there is a way of making a boundary of it. Uh, and this boundary is always a compact, compact, totally disconnected, metrizable space. This is something called the Horf boundary. Uh, it was introduced by Gromov. Um, and actually, it's you can make a boundary for any metric space, but I'm just going to talk about the Horf-Flexen boundary of a graph. So, 
how does the Hora function boundary work? So you're going to take your graph and you're going to consider vector field on it. So a vector field on a graph is you choose some of the edges of the graph and you put arrows on them. And that is a vector field. There's no rules at all. Just you choose some subset of the edges and you orient those edges. And that's what we're going to call a vector field on a graph. And among the vector fields that you have on a graph are the principal vector fields. So a principal vector field is that you choose a vertex of the graph and you orient all the edges so that they point towards that vertex. Right, so what does that mean? That means for each edge, you check its two endpoints. And if one of the endpoints is closer to the vertex in terms of path distance, then the other endpoint, then you orient it pointing towards the closer vertex. Uh, if an edge has the property that its two endpoints are equidistant from the vertex, which isn't happening in this picture, then you just don't orient that edge. Mm -hmm. So uh, every vertex gives you a principal vector field. Uh, there's one for every vertex. And uh, the space of vector fields on your graph is a Cantor space. This is, I mean, it's essentially all functions from <coughs> your set of edges to a three-point space. Right, uh, go this way, go that way, and no orientation. So this is this is just a Cantor space. Uh, and so every vertex is giving you a principal vector field. And so that's an injection from your vertex sent into your space of vector fields. And what's called the Hora function boundary is the accumulation points of your principal vector fields in your set of all vector fields. So you have principal vector fields. So every vertex is determining a vector field. And what you do is, is you take sequences of vertices that are like going off to infinity and you see if the vector field converges to something. So just an example. So here we are in the grid. So there is a vertex and it determines this vector field here. Right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the sequence of vertices that move one step to the right each time. So this determines this vector field, and then we move to the right, and some of the arrows switched, and then we move to the right again, and some of the arrows switch, and so on and so forth. And this gives you a sequence of vector fields, and then this vector field here is an accumulation point on that sequence. So this is now the vector field where arrows here are pointing up, and arrows here are pointing down, and all the horizontal arrows are and pointing to the right. Is a big ball topology? Uh, yes, it's, it's just the product topology. Yeah. Um, and so this is this is a point that's in the horror function boundary of, of this graph. And I guess, right, conceptually, it represents, I guess, some vertex that's like inflamed far over this way. Uh, in fact, the way the horror function boundary of this graph works is for every you know, row of horizontal edges, there's one vertex over on this side at infinity. And there's one vertex at this side over at infinity. And then for every column of vertical edges, there's a vertex at the top and there's a vertex at the bottom. And then there's also four corner vertices corresponding to like, there's a corner vertex up there that corresponds to the vector field where all the arrows point right and up. And that's what the Hoare function boundary of this graph looks like. You go up in some sort of an angle for infinity, we'll get some variation on that. Yeah, well, so you have to, if you choose any sequence of vertices whose x coordinates and y coordinates both go to infinity, then the vector fields that you get converge to the vector field where all the arrows point either right or up. Yeah. Can you explain the name? Is there a. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, Grimov thought that this vector field is like the gradient of a horror function. On this space, where a Hoare function is a thing from hyperbolic geometry, it's the same thing as Gromov boundary. No, this is not the same thing as Gromov boundary. Uh, this this always gives something totally disconnected. Um, and in fact, so for most hyperbolic groups, uh, it gives a Cantor space. Um, although this is a silly example because this is the free group, and the free group, its Gromov boundary is is a Cantor space. And, but in general, what this gives is it gives like a Cantor space that has the Gromov boundary as a quotient. 
I, I must have missed something about the definition of horror function boundary. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Why isn't it always a counter space? Uh, it's always definition? it's always uh, it's a sub so it's a sub closed subspace of, of this and this is a counter space uh -huh. so okay, it's okay. compact totally disconnected right, right, right. metrizable space but it can have isolated points and like the horror function boundary of this grid has lots of isolated points right, it right. Has, it's just not necessarily yeah. perfect got it so it turns out for most hyperbolic groups the horror function boundary is a candor space and the group acts faithfully on the horror function boundary uh, this isn't true for all hyperbolic groups, but it turns out that if you take a hyperbolic group and take its free product with Z, it always fixes the problem. So, and G embeds in G free product Z. So, um, so we can assume that a hyperbolic group uh, is acting faithfully. Uh, okay. And so, where are we? So, we've completed step one. So, we now have an Ital groupoid of germs that we're getting from a hyperbolic group acting on its horror function boundary, and we want to make the topological full group. And so, you know, just for example, so this is an element of the topological full group that you get from a free group, right? So we've cut the boundary of the free group up into some pieces, and this piece is mapping there by some element of the free group, and this piece maps there by some different element of the free group, and these pieces are just staying where they are. Do you have relations for it? Uh, For the free group we do. No, no, no. So, <laughs> so for the uh uh we do not have an algorithm. We have a presentation for this, but uh but we don't have an algorithm to compute that presentation from the hyperbolic group. So we just prove that every hyperbolic group that its boundary is a certain way, and then it follows that you get relations. Okay, so we want to show that this is finally presented. And the strategy for this is that we're going to show that the action is rational. So what does it mean for the action to be rational? So this is, uh, by the way, this is a, a pretty general thing that people use when showing that uh, that these sorts of groups are finally presented. This is the kind of thing that comes up. You want to show Roper's group is finally presented. Uh, this is essentially how Scott showed that her groups were finally presented is using this rationality idea. I'm going to talk about it in some generality, but their proofs were very specific to the groups that they were working on. So what's rational? So you have a homeomorphism of the Kenner set. And what you do is you choose a cone in the domain. And then that cone is mapping to some subset of the range. And you choose the smallest cone that contains that image. So that's homeomorphism, and we choose a domain cone and the smallest range cone that contains that image. And then what that gives you is if you ignore the alpha and the beta, this is like an injection from the Kenner set to the Kenner set, right? Just contained in these pictures here, right? So as that gives you an injection from the Kenner set to itself is what we call the local action uh, of uh, of this homeomorphism on this cone. Sometimes it's called the restriction, uh, but it's not exactly a restriction because we're, we're removing the alphas and the betas at the beginning. So this is the local action of a homeomorphism in the cone. And a homeomorphism is rational if it has only finitely many different local actions. Which is an amazing thing, right? Because there's infinitely many cones. Right. So if a homeomorphism is rational, it has to be like eventually repeating mm -hmm. as you go down, right? You're getting just finally many different local actions. Whenever you see a local action, two local actions that are the same, they have to have the same stuff below them also. So you get this like repeating pattern of local actions as you go down the cones. And this is what are called rational homeomorphisms. And Grigorczyk, Nekershevitz, and Shushansky proved that uh, the rational homeomorphisms form a group. In fact, it's a topological full group. So it even makes sense to talk about whether a germ is rational. So a germ is rational if it's in the hypergroupoid there. 
does it come from finite state automata? Yeah, so um, yeah, so whenever you have a rational homeomorphism, it can be described by a finite state automata. Uh, automata. Uh, this is a little different than the automata that people usually use. So people usually like automata, like when you're doing self-similar groups, where right every time you go along an edge, you input one digit and you output one digit. Right? These are asynchronous automata. So whenever you input a digit, you can output a binary sequence of any length. Right? And that lets the cones move up and down in level. OK, so if you have a group of rational homeomorphisms, uh, you can talk about its nucleus. So the nucleus are the uh, local actions, all the local actions that appear infinitely many times in, in some group element. So you just you look at all the different group elements, and for each group element, uh, you find the local actions that occur infinitely often, and all of those things, that's your nucleus. Sorry, can I go back to the previous thing about... Yes. Um about the rational uh, group. Yeah. So what's what's the groupoid R2? Well, it's just the groupoid of all germs of rational homeomorphisms. OK, so you can just take it all any asynchronous. Uh, OK, so you just yeah, take so all asynchronous um, transformations yeah. Yeah. Of, of C and, and chuck them all into that. Point. Yeah, okay. yeah. You need the uh, you need asynchronous. So, right, the local actions are injections. Yeah. You always need to be careful. You need to choose injections whose images are clopin sets. Of course. Uh, but yeah, but that's yeah, that makes the group point. And it's so the the point is just that like any homeomorphism that's piecewise rational is automatically rational. So, uh, it's so all it's it, basically saying that it's the full group of itself. Yeah, it's the full group of itself. Yeah. Okay, so every every rational every group of rational homeomorphisms has a nucleus. So these are the local uh, actions that keep appearing, and a group is said to be contracting uh, if it has a finite nucleus of local actions. And the theorem is that uh, if you have a groupoid of rational germs and it contains uh, G two, it contains the the groupoid of the full shift, uh, and its topological full group is contracting then its topological full group is finally presented. Um, and this is, so Nekoshevich showed a special case of this theorem. So Nekoshevich considered just the, uh, the group boy that you get from a self-similar group with V thrown in. Uh, but we've proven, we've proven a more general version where it's just any contracting uh, uh, any contracting group of rational homeomorphisms that contains V. And when you say um, like contains G2, do you mean uh, contains G2 with unit space or contains G2? No, I want I want G2 to be a subgroupoid. So, like so it's to be a subgroupoid. So we we have we're on the tenor set, okay. and so I want uh, so I want the groupoid that we're looking at to include among other things all the germs of the shift. Okay. Okay. You know, plus some other stuff. On the same kinds of space. Yeah. On yeah. So right elements, elements of our groupoids are germs of homeomorphisms on the counter space. Yeah. Um, okay. And by the way, uh, we also we generalize this further. Um, so I've stated this just for binary, uh, but uh, it turns out you need to know that it's true on subshifts of finite type. So if you have a subshift of finite type, there's a good definition of rational uh, and there's a good definition of contracting uh, and this theorem is still true. So you have a contracting groupoid of rational germs. Uh, the subshift has to be irreducible and you have to, uh, instead of containing G2, you have to contain all the germs of the, the shift map. Then you get a finally presenting group. Okay, and then what we do is we show that if you have a hyperbolic group whose horror function boundary is a Cantor space, then there's a homeomorphism between that and an irreducible subshift of finite type. Uh, it, actually, I'm lying a little bit there. It's a, it's a clopin subset of an irreducible subshift of finite type. But anyway, so you get a homeomorphism from your horror function boundary to an irreducible subshift of finite type so that uh, the topological full group that we were getting from the hyperbolic group is acting rationally. 
uh, and is indeed contracting. And so this is the proof that the topological full group that we're getting from the hyperbolic group is finally presented. And the, the, the whole bunch of work and the, the contracting is like some hyperbolic geometry and, and we show that uh, uh, all the local actions occur uh, in the generators like uh, before level 37 delta plus 15 or something. <laughs> So anyway, what did you say was the shifts of finite type? Shift I, I you didn't. Um, I didn't say what those were. Yeah. So it's it's a right. It's you have a you have a graph, mm -hmm. and right. It's all the paths in the graph. Well, no, I meant how do you get the shift of finite type? Oh, how do we get it? Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, we make a natural tree. Uh, whose boundary is the Hoare function boundary. Uh -huh. We call it the tree of atoms. And we show that uh, that you can assign types to the vertices of that tree in such a way that it's basically a subshift of finite type. It's through cone types of hyperbolic groups. It's like cone types, but it's it's uh, it's not quite cone types. But it's but the um our proof is very uh like one of the, while you're doing our proof, you get that hyperbolic groups have finitely many cone types. Okay, and just, just very quickly, step three. So we're getting for every hyperbolic group, uh, we're getting a topological full group that's finally presented into which it embeds. Uh, and by the way, it's, it's always purely infinite and minimal. So there's no problem. Uh, actually, <laughs> that it's uh, not usually simple. And actually, even for the free group, this topological full group is not simple. Uh, and in fact, the commutator subgroup of the topological full group only contains the commutator subgroup of the free group. So, uh, so you're really not getting an embedding in a simple group this way. You're getting a nice embedding into a finally presented topological full group, but it's just, it's not going to be simple. Uh, but we have a fix for this. Uh, and the fix is we've proven that under mild hypotheses, uh, basically any finally presented topological full group embeds into a finally presented simple group. Uh, and the mild hypotheses are, uh, you need the isotropy groups to be finally generated and uh, it needs to be a point that has infinite orbit and there has to be a germ at that point for which it's an attracting fixed point, which is like, these things are always true. If your groupoid contains V, or the or the groupoid for the shift. Uh, okay, and the the way we do this is something called twisted Brin-Thompson groups. So just very quickly, so this is a generalization of these Brin-Thompson groups. So remember, a Brin-Thompson group is you take a product of finally many copies of the tau groupoid for the full shift, uh, and you take the topological full group of that and that acts on a tanner square or tanner cube of some kind. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a group of permutations of the numbers one through n. That also acts on the Kenner cube by permutation of coordinates. And uh, we just, we throw those in. So you make the Italian groupoid that's generated by that and the germs of the elements of your permutation group. Uh, and the topological full group is what we call a twisted Britton Thompson group. So it's a Britton Thompson group, but you can like permute coordinates. And these are always simple. And then the observation is that, in fact, there's no reason in this construction that n needs to be finite. Uh, this works perfectly well if H is any group of permutations of a countably infinite set, and you get a topological full group that has H in it. And what we prove is that if the action of H on your set is like really highly transitive, then the twisted Brin Thompson group is finally presented. And that's like always true for topological full groups. Topological full groups act in a very highly transitive way on orbits. And so in particular for all of these hyperbolic groups, you do this construction and you get a finally presented simple group into which you embed. So I'll stop there. Thank you.